First of all, uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, this is our 17th Duke Gen Startup Showcase, and uh, we are thrilled to be with you here. Uh, I just flew in from Durham, North Carolina, as did some of my colleagues and some of our students and alums. So uh, it's just so great to be in New York City back at Yext, um, and uh, I think we're going to have a great night tonight. Uh, before we begin, I just want to take a couple demographic uh, questions here with you all. So raise your hand if this is your first Duke Gen event, if you have not been to a Duke Gen event before. Okay, so that's like more than half of, about half of you. Um, cool. Let's just see a couple more hands here. Um, raise your hand if you went to Duke for undergrad, Trinity, Trinity. All right, let's say undergrad, Pratt. How about undergrad, Broth? Who's the, who are the overachievers here? No? All right, okay. Uh, business school? All right, cool. Uh, what are the other schools? Law school, we got Bill up here. A few, I got five. Uh, are there any other schools that I should miss? Okay, we got the uh, Nick School, Nick school. Uh, school of Medicine. Anyone, no? All right, cool, I think we've covered most of them. Great, well, um, it's a nice mix of folks here. Um, uh, what I'm gonna do is since about half of you have never been to a Duke Gen event before, I'm gonna start by actually telling you a little bit about Duke Gen, this organization that you are here with tonight. So Duke Gen was started with this question, which is, if there is a Duke person interested in entrepreneurship, how do you get them connected to one another? And so uh, we started this group back in 2008, and the tagline for the group is Productive Connections. So we're all about um, having people get connected with one another. And in fact, hopefully tonight you get connected with at least one other person that you have not met before uh, that could be helpful to you or that you could be helpful to. And when we started in 2008, we started online. We created a LinkedIn group. And uh, since we started, we've grown from zero Dukies in 2008 to about 7,000 Dukies uh, this year. And we are um, one of the largest entrepreneurship based, uh, university based entrepreneurship groups on LinkedIn. And that means that there's kind of interesting discussions that happen, or you can kind of find other Dukies that are interested in entrepreneurship. And the LinkedIn group worked well enough that we said, hey, let's try this on Facebook. And we started a Facebook group a few years ago, which I think some of you are probably a part of. And we now have 3,500 members. And we're posting Facebook news. Uh, we're posting news on Duke alums in entrepreneurship on Facebook pretty regularly there. So hopefully you can check us out. Um, just type Duke Gen into your Facebook bar, and you can find our group. Go to the group, not the page. So we started online stuff, and then we started doing offline stuff. So in 2009, we said, hey, why don't we start getting people together and seeing if we can host events in different cities. So uh, in August 2009, these pictures are actually from August 2009, we had volunteer Duke alumni that stepped up to the plate and said, hey, I'm gonna host an entrepreneurship event at a bar in Atlanta or at a restaurant in Washington, D.C. So since 2009, we've had about 300 events in cities all around the country and even a few international cities. And um, this is kind of part of that series. This is uh, one of three events that we host in New York City every year and have hosted in New York City every year for Duke people, for entrepreneurship um, uh, three times a year. Uh, the other thing that's happened is that we get a lot of repeat questions. We get uh, entrepreneurs saying, hey, who are the Duke investors that are out there? So we put up a list of a couple hundred Duke investors. Uh, tell us some stories of, you know, who are the Duke entrepreneurs that have done well? So we started to write stories about Duke entrepreneurs, including some alums like the founders of Melissa and Doug, the founder of Mint.com, the founder of Zico Coconut Water, um, all kind of interesting stories that were started by Duke alums. And uh, finally, we got to the event that we're here at tonight, which is that one of our alums said, hey, like, this is all good, um, but what I'd really like to see is I'd like to see Duke startups pitching to Duke investors uh, in front of a Duke audience. So that's what we did in May 2010 in San Francisco. We had these Duke startups pitching to these Duke investors in front of a Duke-friendly audience. And this is at Dogpatch Labs, uh, which was at Pier 38 in San Francisco. And that event was so uh, well done that we said, let's do it again in New York City. So here we have Duke startups, again, pitching to mostly Duke investors um, at the Dog Patch Labs, which uh, was in New York City at Union Square. So um, since that time, there's been some really interesting things that have happened. Um, uh, it turns out that uh, not 
due to our, our, our events, but um, maybe, you know, maybe we deserve just a tiny bit of credit that some of these folks that have presented have gone on to raise money and have gone on to um, do pretty well with their companies. So here's just kind of a smattering of different companies that have gone through. So that's Duke Gen in a nutshell. For those of you where this is your first event, there's a ton of ways to get involved, and uh, we printed some of them on the back cover of these uh, very nice glossy brochures here. Um, we'd love to have you all join us online and to keep joining us offline here uh, in New York City, and um, uh, just kind of thrilled to, to have you here. Um, there's just a couple more things I want to say, which is that there's been some really exciting stuff going on on campus. I can't go through all of it, but I'll just say that uh, we got a $15 million gift from David Rubenstein um, about five years ago, and that $15 million has really transformed what innovation and entrepreneurship have looked like at Duke. So for example, um, we run a program called Startup Connect, which is all about getting start startup internships for Duke students. So if you are looking for an intern um, for your company, please send us a note. We also have uh, the Duke Angel Network, which has launched, and Ryan Fru, right over there. Uh, Ryan uh, helps run the Duke Angel Network. Ryan, would you like to come up and say a, a few things here? Uh, yeah. I've got your, I've actually got your slides here, um, if you want to talk to those. So Ryan works, uh, Ryan and I work in the office together and uh, he has helped start the Duke Angel Network which has been around for two years and I'm gonna let him tell you a little bit more about that. Yeah, so just real quick, the basic concept is that we're a group of Duke alumni, primarily a couple faculty members as well, um, investing in uh, early stage companies founded by Duke alumni. Um, so obviously relevant to this audience. Um, so we're generally looking like kind of late at later end of the seed stage into series A territory, um, looking for a product that's been launched, some sort of revenue traction, uh, you know, initial signs of adoption and growth, um, both on the tech side and medical devices um, and, you know, consumer goods as well. So we're, we're pretty open. Our primary filter is just the Duke connection. Um, so happy to chat if you're interested either on the investor side or the entrepreneur side, uh, feel free to grab me. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ryan. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a great network. They have 115 members. Here's some of their statistics, uh, which you're happy to uh, ask me for, but they've made 16 investments. Here's a bunch of their portfolio companies. And what you'll see here, I know that the text is a little bit small, is that the portfolio companies are all around the country and in all different sectors. So if you are an entrepreneur um, looking to raise money, uh, definitely think of the Duke Angel Network. Um, okay, so that's the introduction to, um, uh, to Duke Gen and to some of the stuff going on on campus. There's a lot more going on on campus, but um, I don't want to go into all of it just for brevity, uh, but I'm happy to talk with you all about it um, after the event. What we're going to do now is we're going to go into the main event, which is hearing pitches from entrepreneurs. Uh, before we do that, I want to introduce you to our three panelists here. Uh, have them actually come on stage to introduce themselves, so if you don't mind, come on up here. Um, we've been really fortunate in that we've had a ton of panelists over the years, uh, and uh, these are our, our three panelists for this year, and I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan to introduce himself and talk about his background a little bit and maybe what he's looking forward to for, for tonight. Sure. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Jonathan Drillings. Uh, I was Pratt 04. Um, I work uh, at a firm called Riverside Acceleration Capital. Uh, basically, what we do is um, kind of non-traditional VC. Uh, so we work with companies between kind of two and twelve million in revenue. Uh, we have a bit of a unique model, but um, we invest behind those companies to aid in growth and to you know continue to invest behind them for the long term. We focus on enterprise software, um, so that's what I know best, and that's what I'll be able to best help with probably. And what are you looking for tonight from the presenters, if anything? Excitement. <laughs> cool. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Byrne, and I'm a Duke undergrad graduate. And uh, I co-founded my own company five years ago uh, called Kesne. And we help Fortune 500 companies and organizations uh, accelerate innovation by working with startups. So we really play a connective role. So a lot of you here might have solutions for our corporate clients. Um, we just recently concluded female founders in tech 
focused on fintech and insure tech, had a great turnout, no Duke uh, applicants. Um, so we're hoping to see more of that next time around. Um, but if any of you are interested in joining that event, it's December 11th at the Verizon Open Innovation Lab. Come see me after if you'd like to attend. Um, uh, separate to running Kesne, I also have made about seven angel investments, and I typically focus on mobile technology um, and, um, I guess, solutions that solve tangible problems. Um, so I guess that's what I would be looking for. I also am a little bit jet lag coming in from Europe, so energy is key, <laughs> so I don't nod off. Um, and uh, happy to answer any questions after. Thank you, Jen. Hi, I'm Lisa Burton, and I was Pratt 2007. I'm a big believer in the Duke network. My first boss after grad school was a Duke alum, and actually the first investor in the company I co-founded was a Duke alum, so always good things happen when you're around Duke people. I'm the director of Hearst Lab. We're a greenhouse for early stage women-led startups in media and tech. So what I'm typically looking for are high growth companies that have some affiliation with something that Hearst can be useful with. So obviously we have our media companies, but we also have a number of data as a service companies in finance and transportation and healthcare. My background is actually data science, so I always love seeing companies that have really interesting data and um, really exciting things going on in their future. Thank you. All right, uh, let's give them all a big round of applause here. Um, and so now we're going to start our showcase. What's going to happen here is that each of the startups that you're going to see tonight is going to have five minutes to present, uh, and then they're going to take one question from our panelists here. Uh, after all nine teams present, the, the judges are going to go off down the hall here for about 10 minutes, and while they're selecting their top team, we're going to have you, the audience, pull out your cell phones and select your favorite team. We're also gonna bring all the teams on stage so that you can ask questions collectively of any of the teams that presented tonight. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Um, I do wanna say one thing before we begin, and actually I'm going to need to switch laptops here since our PowerPoints are on the other laptop. But uh, would love for, are you first? You are first. I believe so. Okay, yes. Let's have you pull in your laptop here. I would love it for us to uh, um, give a big round of applause every time uh, a company comes up to present because uh, you know I think it takes a certain amount of courage to put yourself out there, do it here in front of the live audience, do it on a live stream here, and so uh, you know want to make this a culture of you know really encouraging these entrepreneurs. So with that in mind, let's please welcome uh, Casper of Carpe Lotion, our first presenter tonight. Thank you, Howie. Uh, let me just make sure you guys have samples here. And if anybody in the audience doesn't have a sample, uh, please let me know afterwards, because I've got enough to go around. Uh, so my name's Casper Kubica. I'm the co-founder of Carpe Lotion. Um, I am stumble over my words a lot, so I think uh, the best way to introduce Carpe would be to give the floor over to my co-founder, David, and myself in a pre-recorded commercial uh, that we're airing on national TV right now. So with that, here we are. Hi, I'm Casper. And I'm David. And we both had a really embarrassing problem. Sweaty hands and feet. So we started to look for a solution. And when we couldn't find any, we decided to make one. Carpe Antiperspirant Lotion. It's really simple to use. Just rub in a dab and say goodbye to the sweat. We started hearing from thousands of people who are using and loving Carpe to help stop the sweat. And we learned that it's actually a medical condition called hyperhidrosis or excessive sweating and that millions of Americans have it. So we said, let's meet these folks. And we hopped on a plane. This is it. Hi. And we met Jamie. Hyperhidrosis makes it super hard to shake hands with people, super hard to meet people. It just made everything that I did a little more irritating. But with Carpe, it's definitely better. I would recommend Carpe to anyone who is feeling insecure about their hand sweat. So if you, like Jamie, like us, have suffered from sweaty hands and feet, you're the reason we made Carpe. Try it out at carpelotion.com.
So that's Carpe, and that's where we are today. Um, but a brief history of how we got here. So my co-founder, David, and I, we started working on this formula in 2014. You know, we wanted a solution for our sweaty hands. And a year later, after 60 prototypes, I became selected as a Melissa and Doug entrepreneur. And thanks to that program, I was connected to Ben, Jay, and Chris, uh, three Duke alumni. They call themselves Bootstrap Advisors. And they came in with a $50,000 investment, enough for our first production run, and years of expertise on starting a company. You know, we were two college sophomores. We had no idea what we were doing. Oh, by the way, I graduated in May. I was going to say that earlier, but mixing it all up. Uh, and thanks to the help of Bootstrap today, we have a $1.2 million run rate, and we're one of the top-selling antiperspirants on Amazon. So I want to talk about this problem that Carpe is helping to solve. It's called hyperhidrosis, or the condition of excessive sweating, particularly in the hands feet, and underarms, and it's massively underreported and underdiagnosed. It affects about one in 10 adults and about one in five teens, according to the most recent statistics. And the th reason so many people don't realize how significant this is, is because people like me, people with hyperhidrosis, we really learn how to hide it. We don't shake hands, we don't hold hands, we don't hold onto objects for a long time because you can see the sweat on them. Um, and it really affects quality of life more than any other skin disease. This is from a dermatological report. Over half of people with hyperhidrosis have changed career paths because of it. And those one in five teens, 75% of them said it impairs daily life. And the reason these people aren't getting help is because effective treatments are out there. You know, you have surgical options, you have prescription options, but they're expensive. The side effects are massive. There's no accessible treatments for hyperhidrosis. Except one, and that's over-the-counter antiperspirants for underarms. Uh, you know, you can get them at any store. That's the stuff you probably put on this morning. That works for hyperhidrosis just as it works for regular sweating. But there was nothing like that for the hands and feet, and that's what David and I wanted when we realized we both have sweaty hands and it was becoming a real impediment in our lives. And that's what we made. We developed Carpe Lotion. It's over-the-counter, non-irritating, which makes it very accessible, but it's effective. And dermatologists recommend it as a first line of treatment for hyperhidrosis, even for up to moderate cases. Uh, so real quick, I want to touch the team is almost exclusively Duke. My co-founder, David, uh, he went to UNC, but he was a Robertson scholar, so he spent a semester at Duke. So I'm counting him as Duke. Uh, but Bootstrap got us to where we are today. And Dr. Patel, who was Duke undergrad and med school, uh, he came onto our board of advisors recently, and he works with a lot of hyperhidrosis patients and has been instrumental in guiding us to developing more and more effective treatments. Um, so we have an annual run rate of $1.2 million right now. Lifetime sales are over a million. We're in an aggressive period of growth right now, as you can see. And that's thanks to that TV ad that I showed you, because we're getting $1.50 back on every dollar we spend on that TV ad. So we really found our scalable growth here. And we're also taking dermatology very seriously. Like I said, dermatologists are recommending Carpe, and we wanna be out there competing with the surgical and the prescription options. We wanna be taken seriously as a treatment for hyperhidrosis. So we've shown that this serious treatment to hyperhidrosis coming from an OTC angle is a huge opportunity. But right now, we need to seize that opportunity. And for that reason, we're raising a $2 million round to keep growing access and to grow efficacy into more severe cases of hyperhidrosis. So on the access side, a lot of people still don't have access that could benefit from Carpe just because they don't know that it exists, that they can do something about their sweaty hands. And that's why the TV ads are working so well. And that's why a big part of this round is spending more on the TV ads. And that's massively growing interest from retailers, seeing a bigger and bigger customer base. We already have four minutes, five minutes? That was fast. I'll get through the rest really quick. Um, we have a goal of getting into 20,000 retail locations by 2020 and also continuing to innovate and create more effective treatments. The Carpe Hyperhidrosis Regimen, the next step of that development is already underway. Um, I just want to get to a final story here to anybody who still doesn't believe that hyperhidrosis is worth the investment. That's what pharma companies thought about acne in the 80s. And proactive OTC treatment became a billion dollar company, proved them wrong. We think hyperhidrosis is the next disease area where that's going to happen and Carpe is the next company. So thank you for giving me your time and trying out Carpe. Thanks for the energy on that one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it was exciting. So um, you talked a lot about TV advertising. It was a cool ad. How come you're going so aggressively towards TV and not going after digital where you can really slice and dice the market? Yeah. So the story here is that you know we've been around for two years, and we've been doing a lot of testing on marketing. Uh, so our growth has really started to be monumental this spring when TV we really put into full force, but all last year was a big testing year for us, and TV was just the end of that. That was after trying 
Facebook ads, Google ads, all sorts of things like that where you can really target people. And the thing about hyperhidrosis is because it's so underreported and underdiagnosed, a lot of people don't self-identify. So we're getting good organic traffic when people are looking for a solution just thanks to our Amazon presence. But when it comes to all of these people that could benefit from it, a lot of them, you know, they don't show up on any targeting criteria on Google, on Facebook. And that's why the broad population targeting that TV makes very affordable has worked very, very well for us. That said, we still think there's a lot of room to improve on digital, so we're actually bringing Brian Rosenblatt, uh, he's a director of sales at Reddit, onto our board of advisors. Um, don't know if I was supposed to disclose that. Nothing signed, but you know, he's no. basically coming on, so. Let's cut that from the video, okay, guys? Cut that from the video, yeah, but we, we are taking that part of modern marketing very seriously as well. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Let's give thank Casper you. one more round of applause here. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just a point of order here. The um, uh, Fathom was not able to come here tonight, so we're gonna jump right into Focusmate here. So if you've read much news over the last year, you've probably noticed that there's a huge shift happening in society's relationship with technology. And <clears throat> What we're seeing is this unprecedented backlash against the siphoning of our attention by addictive technologies. And there's always been technology naysayers, right? But what's really uh, unique about what's happening right now is for the first time we have this massive, highly visible evidence of the consequences this is having um, on our productivity. We have the highest incidence of procrastination in history on our mental health, we have a mental health crisis, and of course, on our politics. <clears throat> um, if this is not enough evidence that we've reached this sort of boiling point with this problem, something really crazy happened last week. The, uh, the founding president of Facebook, Sean Parker, went on stage at a big conference on video and basically slammed Facebook. And I'll paraphrase what he said, which is that the founding, uh, the Facebook founders knowingly and purposefully exploited a weakness in human psychology. They knew what they were doing and they did it anyway. But what they didn't fully grasp was the scale of the consequences this would have on our society, on our relationships, on our children. Um, all of this is by way of saying this is a very big problem. So, we decided to build the anti-Facebook to use the same incredibly powerful behavioral triggers for good instead of evil. What we're doing is harnessing everything that we know about behavioral science to eliminate procrastination, to make it easier and more rewarding to focus and accomplish your most important work. Our starting point is a virtual co-working product. And the core of the user experience is the Focusmate session. This is a carefully structured 50-minute video interaction in which you and another user act as accountability partners. You sit together side by side while you do your work. And while I could tell you about all of the behavioral science that's baked into this product, the bottom line is that it is ridiculously effective. Over 95% of our users say that Focusmate improves their productivity by at least 50%. And our vision is that in the future, Focusmate will be the place where people go to get work done. My background is executive coaching. I've worked with clients like Yale and Wharton and numerous startup executives, many here in New York. My primary area of expertise is behavioral change. And I've teamed up with the world's top behavioral designer, Nir Ayal, who uh, literally wrote the book on how to build habit-forming products and consults to many of the world's top companies on product design. Um, so that's all I've got. If you're an investor, come talk to me, send me an email. Everyone else, Focusmate is live, it's free. You should absolutely get out your addictive technology now and go sign up at focusmate.com. Thank you.
Thanks. No, I think you're addressing a really significant problem, so it's great to see this idea uh, come to life. I guess um, from a practical standpoint, what is the business model if it's free to the end user? Yeah, so it's a, our, our uh, playbook is a freemium model, uh, modeled after what LinkedIn has done. Um, and we've actually done some monetization, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, but um, the freemium model looks like uh, monetizing the most motivated segments, right? So um, examples of things that people uh, will pay for would be um, having like a, an accountability coach facilitate a session or being part of a, a private group that uh, only, you only have um, access to if you're a, if you're a paid user. Or um, part of our product roadmap is, is a personalized focus made experience. So um, um, being part of affiliate groups like the Duke Network um, or uh, joining a Coursera course that you're part of or having uh, favorites or, or friends essentially that you prefer to work with. So putting limits on that above which you become a, a paid user. Uh, the, the monetization that we did, um, we knew we wanted to do the freemium model and focus on network effects and stay free, but we also wanted to check the box of making sure that people will actually pay for this. So we actually targeted just a subset of our users. We didn't want to kind of like spoil the whole thing, but we targeted uh, a subset of our users, 37 users, and offered them um, a lifetime discount in exchange for paying a monthly subscription. So we basically offered them nothing except a future discount, and 22 of them converted into paid subscribers. We've had one churn, and we actually had one person reach out and ask if they could pay for Focusmate, so we're back up to 22, which is about a 56% conversion rate. Great. Thank you, and thank you, Taylor. We are now on to uh, Living Lab with Mitchell Gorecki. Let's give Mitchell a big round of applause. Uh, th thank you very much, Howie. Uh, my team is in the back here. We have uh, Colin, uh, Bo, and Gerald. You can raise your hands. So if somebody has an idea uh, and they think that they know how to do this better, please talk to us. Uh, again, my name is Mitchell. I am a Duke undergrad 2013. I studied biomed engineering, mechanical engineering, economics, and finance, and I will be completing my uh, degree in Fuqua in 2018. So I'm here to talk to you about Living Lab. Uh, and the best way to do this is in context of a story. So I was renting this property for 950 bucks uh, about three years ago. And to make it a lot cheaper for myself, I decided to list the bedrooms on Craigslist. Uh, but when you ask uh, for strangers to live with you for $316 a month, uh, you get a lot of apps. And so I found 10 people I liked, uh, and I let them go into a bidding war. I wound up with three people willing to pay me 900 bucks a month uh, for a bedroom. And so the business school side of me thought, wait a minute, I don't own this house. It cost me 950, I'm making 2700. How do I get more of these? And how do I do it for less energy? Uh, and that gets at the problem, is that the process of renting property with roommates uh, kind of sucks. It is really difficult to find people you trust, take group preferences, and then match that into a dynamically changing housing market. Uh, and that is the solution Living Lab offers. We are a platform for creating and managing co-living contracts. So that mess you saw, uh, we're able to very efficiently create the best groupings of people based on their mutual interest towards those properties. Uh, so how does this work? Hopefully I can get the demo. Uh, great, so, so here's the platform. We're basically saying uh, you're presented with a property uh, and potential roommates. And uh, we can go in and look at these roommates' information and we think, eh, you know, I don't really like this guy. Give me a better recommendation. And so essentially what we've done is we've scanned over group preferences of other individuals and their preferences for housing and created a feasible recommendation that could actually work as a roommate pair. Uh, and so we can kind of say, well, you know, I don't like this house. Oh, look, I get to live by myself in this one. Uh, oh, here, this is a great group. And I can say yes to the in group as a whole, which triggers a process to ask the other individuals in that group if they would want to live with me. And so it's a very quick way to actually find feasible living arrangements. Uh, so how do we monetize this? We charge each tenant $200 a month for four very specific things. We manage the relationships. So we're actually able to get everyone on a group contract and fiscally responsible for one another. Uh, we also do this for your utilities. And in the case of our uh, bottom tenant here, we swap him out if he doesn't actually pay his rent. Uh, but you can imagine if that guy actually owned all the furniture, it would be a big problem. So now you have a vacant house. So your $200 a month also gets you furnishing through that property. Uh, as well as all of the consumables that you would have to be otherwise splitting with your roommates. 
And then lastly, which is one of the really cool parts, is that we're making these recommendations with respect to other properties, which means your neighbors are very likely also Living Lab candidates, and they just invited your house over for a barbecue. So we've done this across 13 properties, interviewing 220 people, matching 42 of them into properties uh, to process about $250,000 of rent. Uh, from that, we've been able to collect $37,000 in revenue uh, with some really cool stats here. So the first is, is no property lasted more than two days on the platform. We're able to keep about 30% of this. Uh, and when we allow the actual property values to fluctuate in rent, we can raise those rents by about 48%. Uh, the other fun part is you get to talk with people. You write code, you normally don't get to see the output. But uh, we actually get calls from people saying, gosh, you know, this was super easy. Uh, I owe you a beer. And my personal favorite was, uh, how much do I wire you to secure my spot? Because I can see how quick these contracts move. Uh, so how many people are there like this? Uh, we estimate that there is 111 million individuals who are the renters. Uh, 73 million actually search with other adults. And 19 million are doing this with their friends. Uh, that works out to about 175 billion dollar TAM and a 46 billion dollar SAM. Uh, but top down is kind of hard to understand. So if we just look at Duke, there's 9,500 graduate students, which holding the same numbers constant is a 23 million dollar revenue stream. So our goal is to target the 122 million dollars that's just surrounding Duke. So this is your, your UNC, your Raleigh, and your Durham. Uh, so what are our next steps? Well, the first one is we have to get properties on the platform. Uh, and we were very fortunate enough to have Oakwood Properties offer to list 25,000 complexes on this platform. Uh, so that's going to be our next big step. Uh, so you have to complement that with your actual tenants, though. And so uh, the focus is going to be launching local campaigns in areas we know to really control this, uh, this pilot. And lastly, uh, securing funding to actually help us achieve these, uh, these goals. So thank you very much. So just one clarification question. I'm, I'm interested in who is paying the $200 per month. And then I would love to understand post the triangle area what your, what your plan is for expansion. So the actual individual tenant is. So they've contracted to the landlord to pay their rent. And then they've contracted to Living Lab to pay $200 a month for the relationship management, the consumables, and the furniture. And we're able to take a 30% margin on that, $200 a month. And then your question was, how, how are we going to expand and grow, and what is our strategy for attacking? Uh, we're we're going to focus on groups of individuals who are constantly searching with turnover, so uh, universities or corporate relocation programs. And specifically, that was appeal, uh, the appeal to Oakwood. So they say, gosh, you know, we have tons of singles who get located from San Fran to Durham, uh, but they can't afford our premium services, and we have to turn them away one at a time. Wouldn't it be great if they could all meet together on one centralized place? Uh, henceforth Living Lab. And so that's going to be our strategy moving forward. Thank you, Mitchell. Let's give him a round of applause. Next up is Jake Stock with NeuroPlus. Hi, everyone. I'm Jake with NeuroPlus, and we have developed brain sensing technology to improve your cognitive abilities. Or as we like to say, to build better brains. And we're starting with the problem of attention. Attention is your brain's ability to take in all of the information that attacks it and to focus in on what's important and ignore the rest. The ability to pay attention is the biggest predictor of academic achievement in children and workplace productivity in adults. Attention might be the most important thing that your brain does. And we all have trouble paying attention. Like back over there, for example, uh, having a little trouble. Um, but in particular, individuals with ADHD, with autism, with age-related cognitive decline, with uh, traumatic brain injury, these individuals have attention deficits that are debilitating. And for them, Treatments are either non-existent or carry serious side effects and complications. NeuroPlus is clinically proven to improve your ability to pay attention. Users wear a wireless EEG headset that measures their brain activity, their body movement, and their muscle tension. And they play a training video game that challenges them to focus to sit completely still, 
and to relax as much as possible. The more they focus, the more they sit still, the more they relax, the faster their dragon flies, or the further ahead they see in a tunnel while they're speeding through on a hover bike, or the faster their ship sails around this world. And the more they practice, the more they improve, and they're able to improve their attention over time. And it, it sounds too good to be true, but this really works. We conducted a randomized, controlled, blinded clinical study with researchers at Duke University and Stanford, and we found that children with ADHD that use NeuroPlus improved their ADHD symptoms four times more than kids using traditional treatments like medication. And it was really important for us to not only build this incredible technology, but to make it accessible to families and individuals that really need it. So we've priced it at an affordable price point of $99 plus a $30 monthly fee. And that's really paid off for us because we launched NeuroPlus at the end of September, and in our first 50 days, we already have over $150,000 in pre-orders. And we're really just scratching the surface. We're starting with this initial population of individuals with a specific condition that affects their attention, like the conditions I mentioned before, 25 million adults and children in the US. But then we can move on to the 100 million children and adults that have reported significant issues with attention but don't have a diagnosed condition. Love to tell you more about our team. I was a neuroscience researcher at Duke. Our CTO was the leader of the Brain and Technology Lab at the University of Amsterdam. And we've got a great team of advisors that includes the Director of Human Performance Optimization at Duke, the former Mighty Eagle behind Rovio and Angry Birds, the most successful game of all time, the former CTO of Walt Disney Studios and Pixar, and Melissa Bernstein, founder of Melissa and Doug. So we have built this amazing technology. We have proven that it really works. And we've proven that there's incredible demand for what we're doing with our pre-order campaign. Now we're raising $2 million to scale up our sales and marketing customer acquisition efforts and to expand our training content so we can create training experiences that are engaging for a wider variety of audiences. And what that gets us is 15,000 subscribers, which amounts to a $6 million annual recurring revenue and cash flow, uh, cash, cash flow positive at that point. So I'd love to take your questions, tell you more about NeuroPlus. Thank you so much. Very cool. Uh, I could probably use that. Um, Still so available for pre-order. Sorry? Still available for pre-order. Excellent. Um, so what, once you kind of get through pre-orders and, and you know, the, the initial uh, part of your sales cycle, are you guys going to be going you know, more broadly with this as a consumer solution, or are you going to be specifically trying to work with you know, clinics or other types of folks that could bring this in as more of like a clinical type solution? Yeah, absolutely. So we, uh, we are going direct to consumer for the time being. Um, we can explore clinical solutions down the road, but this we envision as a consumer product and the first real consumer product that actually works and that actually does what we're saying, the first brain training product for consumers that's effective. So we, uh, we go direct to consumer, we acquire customers mostly through um, Facebook campaigns. Before we launched our pre-order campaign, we did six months of user acquisition testing, found they were able to achieve uh, a customer acquisition cost of under $50 through a Facebook uh, digital marketing campaigns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jake. All right, I haven't yet seen Matt. There he is, just sitting on the other side. All right, give it up for Matt Tolnick and Scramblers. Thanks, everyone. So what you see on the first slide there is Lawless Crafted Creations. Um, about four and a half years ago, I started Lawless Jerky. You may have seen it around New York a little bit. Um, our sales and distribution here are stronger than in most places. Uh, it's a 100% grass-fed beef jerky product. Um, it's been on the market really for most of the last four years. And you know, the problem that I was facing is we weren't a first mover into our space. So people would always be asking you, how are you different? How do you differentiate yourselves? And we have did things throughout time um, when it comes to creating flavors that the world hadn't seen using grass-fed beef before anyone else did. Um, but pe people would move into our space and pretty quickly we, we, we lack that differentiation. So you know, I resolved when it came to coming out with a new product to come up with something that would solve that problem uh, as well as solve a problem for uh, people looking for healthy and nutritious food. So 
what we've created. Um, here's, here's a little bit on the Lawless Jerky brand. Um, so while this, this new brand is a startup, um, we're not. We've done uh, about $2 million in revenue last year. We're in thousands of stores um, from convenience to grocery to um, like, uh, you know, the Dwayne Reeds in, in New York, we're in a, a good portion of them. Um, but the product I'm here to talk to you guys about today um, solves a breakfast problem. So uh, at breakfast time, a lot of the, the food that you'll see is high in carbohydrates, whether it be processed sugars, processed carbohydrates, um, some of the things you see here, uh, yogurts, like even the Greek yogurts that have a lot of protein in them, they also have a lot of sugar, it seems like. Uh, kind bars or, or kind of have that congealing sugar that keeps them together, um, so on and so forth. A lot of these other products are filled with um, our artificial preservatives. Uh, what we wanted to do is create a morning product that would almost be like a jerky equivalent. So you know, high in protein, low in carbs. Um, in this case, uh, it's also high in fat. And what we've created is the first ever shelf-stable um, bar that's, that's based on whole liquid eggs. Um, why, why eggs? Um, eggs are one of the lowest cost, highest efficiency, highest nutrient foods in the world. They're actually a superfood. Um, people since 2000 have come to realize that two eggs a day are okay, whereas before it was, you know, watch out for eating eggs, they're bad for your heart. Um, so we're looking to take advantage of, you know, people's different change in preferences for more protein, being cool with fat, understanding since 2000 that cholesterol in your eggs doesn't mean cholesterol in your body. Um, and so what we've created is a uh, on-the-go, portable, shelf-stable bar. So um, just like Kind Bars, except with you know, egg being our plurality of ingredient. Um, it's, it's about 38% 30, egg. Um, and no, no one has ever been able to do this before. So the government tried to do this um, some time ago and, and failed. They published a 150-page report on why it couldn't be done. Um, what we have here is uh, some nutritional labels. Um, I, I, I pitched to a group out of Boston uh, who does work for really billion dollar brands that we'd never be able to afford their services, but they love the idea and they come, came on for equity. Um, what you see here is uh, you know, our, our nutritional labels. So you'll see higher in fat, higher in protein, and one gram of carbohydrates, four gram of carbohydrates, two grams of carbohydrates. So this really fits in with the modern low carb trends Diabetic audience, there's 30 million uh, folks with diabetes in the country, um, and then you know all sorts of fitness folks looking for uh, low-carb, ketogenic products for their lifestyle. Um, so really what this is is a hidden in plain sight innovation, and um, the process that we've been able to use to get this to be shelf-stable um, has been around for 150 years but never applied in this way um, through a, a Duke a uh, friend of mine, we were actually able to apply for uh, a patent on both the product and process. Um, that's patent pending right now, but in the food space, it's really hard to really own anything. Going back to you know, my issues with jerky, um, you know, other people would kind of come in and do grass-fed. They'd come in and do the exact same flavor name that you had. Here, we'll actually be able to have kind of a, an, an island to ourselves. Um, you know, do, does, does the market want this? Where, where's the need? Um, snacking is, you know, m most, most of the folks here t today are on the younger side, um, just al always busy running from thing to thing. Um, meals, probably eating less meals than people did a generation ago. Uh, seven in 10 people snack to replace meals entirely. 95% uh, of people are snacking at some point in the afternoon, but the morning, um, the morning crowd is a little bit underserved when it comes to snacking. Five minutes? All right. Um, so basically, uh, we see ourselves as the next in the line of bars, from RX Bar to Epic Bars, who've come along and catered um, to, an, to an audience with something that really hasn't existed before, um, do, doing it more healthy. And you know, for us, we're able to improve on the, the sugar content while delivering the protein at a better price point. Thank you. How much are you raising? <clears throat> um, so we're raising a million dollars. Uh, and with that, we'll be able to establish proof of concept both online and in about 100 retail stores, three to five different chains, 20 to 25 stores uh, per chain across channels. Uh, we'll be heavy on the demo. Uh, this is you know, the, the, the one 
concern that people have when it comes to this product is a possible ick factor. How did they get eggs to be shelf stable? Um, so we think it's important to you know, get this product into people's mouths, educate them face to face, um, and you know, doing demos is pretty expensive. So uh, a good portion of the million dollars will go toward that, and um, you know, the rest really going to uh, cost of goods sold is the next big ticket item. And just to follow up, will you be able to leverage those prior retail relationships? Oh, totally. Um, one, one thing I didn't get into is uh, Lawless Jerky signed a deal with Monogram Foods, which is a um, $800 million a year food company. Um, they have heavy retail relationships throughout the country that we'll be leveraging on the jerky side. As, as we meet new retailers, we'll, we'll have them in our arsenal too. That's great. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. We are going to now welcome uh, Stell Life, run by Sid Cundin. Let's give him a big round of applause. Hey, Sally. Hey, Sally. All right, before I begin, can I get a show of hands of who's involved in healthcare at all? Just to make sure. Sweet. Pretty good crowd. All right, I'm Sid, here for Stell, and we make smart vitals connectivity easy. And what does that mean? Well, so the chronic disease landscape in America, this is the reason healthcare is hard. You guys who raised your hands clearly know that. 99% of CMS Medicare dollars are spent for chronic disease containment management. Four or five health, health, healthcare dollars are spent on this problem. You can see over there, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, the device is there for foreshadowing purposes. So because of that, there's a lot of industries and a lot of companies involved in it. You probably know it. You probably have friends who started it. You probably have friends' grandparents who started their own because it's, it's becoming franchise kind of commodity-like. But in that market, there's care management services, corporate programs, healthcare data services, ACOs, and home health entities. The thing they all share in common, they utilize remote vital monitoring services. So let's go to the hospital, for example. So... At Duke and other hospitals, they send patients home with tablets and devices to track their measurements to make sure that they're safe and healthy. Then there's also care services uh, by nurses uh, to provide home care. $245 billion is spent in 2015 on home care services. 40% of that budget was on remote, de de remote devices. Sorry, the echo of the mic. Just not used to that. All right. And the last is corporate wellness programs. You have major companies like Active Care and Livongo that are getting involved in this. Glenn Tolman, the former CEO of Allscripts, started Livongo because he saw this opportunity. And there's a big incentive for corporations to do this. You can see 30% reduction of uncontrolled hypertension. You can save billions, it's kind of crazy. Now, the key issue they all have is connectivity. What I mean by that, it means that the user experience is flawed. They're just designed to be kind of odd. They're super expensive. Labor's the most expensive thing in healthcare. And there's errors, and it's also really hard to scale. And that's why people are just setting up these pop shops. And so what we've done is we made that all easy. And I have the device right here. It's this little hub right here. You plug it into any outlet. And that's it. This room is now a vitals office. You can communicate any Bluetooth device from a scale, blood pressure cuff, thermometer, glucose meter, even Snapchat glasses, to whatever endpoint they need to go to. And so from a patient perspective, this solves that pairing and connection issue. They don't have to worry about it. You don't need a phone. You don't need Wi-Fi. You don't really need anything. Just plug and play. And for a care manager aspect, they just have the data into their existing platform so they don't have to manage another platform. It's right there where they expect it to go to. Now, this is actually a use case at a care management company called Globe Healer. And those are actual patient data results. You can see after they were readmitted, sorry, after they were admitted to the hospital, they came home with a device and they were able to manage their weight. Uh, we changed the numbers a little bit because of patient health information, but um, here's another dash of Globe Healer monitoring multiple patients, and as well as an ROI summary that they would have for a corporation in which they're giving this vitals tool to. So in terms of pricing, McKinsey did a study in that for wellness device monitoring, 
consumers pay with 312 one-time fee or annual service fee of $166. The existing solutions, the hospital solution we talked about, it's like $4,700. Livongo is $70 per employee per month. Two net Qualcomm device, it's like $300 up front and then $20 monthly, $25 monthly service fee. We make that simple also. Right there, it's just $80 for the gateway and then $10 a month. And so we're really focused on giving this to the care managers out there so they can enable better care services and also devices don't have to worry about the connectivity aspect. It's all just taken care of. And in terms of upcoming pilots, so February 2018, we're doing a 400 employee pilot with the Department of Commerce in Philadelphia. We're working with Comcast, as well as Globe Healer, that care management company on the pilot. Soon after, we're gonna be working with Livongo and Active Care on a corporate insurance broker opportunity to do all of those chronic conditions. That's diabetes, hypertension, obesity, heart failures. And then in the future, we're in really excited about opportunities with the Duke Institute for Health Information, as well as a few other pairs. This is our team. Um, so I met my uh, first co-founder, Carlos, when we were working at Facebook together. We were on the search team, and uh, we worked on different trending and ranking analysis. And uh, my second co-founder, John, he and I were in the Bluetooth community. That's how we figured out all this. I made the first Bluetooth library for Facebook, uh, and then John and I soon adapted and scaled it after that. Here's a few investors. And in the future, when I say any Bluetooth device, I'm talking about those as well. So going back to any Bluetooth device, yeah. whenever you started talking about vitals, of course, I immediately thought about the consumer wearables. And so I'd love to understand if those are still, the dashboards and everything that comes with the consumer wearables are still accessible by those consumers, or if this has any interference in any way with those. Great question. So the dashboard for the consumer wearables, like an Apple Health? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, does this interfere with the consumer wearable dashboards? Correct? Okay, okay cool. Um, so. Actually, a funny story about the wearables aspect. We were at New Jersey Hymns just a couple months ago, and we had our device scan for all the wearables in, in the room and display it, and we had a bunch of people come to the booth, and they were all like looking at their fitness tracker and uh, looking for the device to come up there. And anyway, but in terms of the dash, it doesn't interfere unless, if the person uses an app to get it onto their dash, uh, you know, they can still use the app. It doesn't like prevent the app from working, but we're hoping that they don't have to worry about having another app on their phone and that we can work with that company to have it go directly to their dash. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, thank you very much, Sid. <laughs> Next up is Elizabeth Spears. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I'm Elizabeth, actually, Spires, but everybody Spires. calls me Spears. I answer to it now. And this is my colleague, Michael Woodsmall. Uh, we're a progressive messaging and targeting firm here in New York City, and we're raising money for a product that facilitates easy end-to-end -end content creation, testing, and audience targeting on a variety of social platforms in one seamless process. We're a bit of an anomaly in this pitch competition because we're pre-product but not pre-revenue. Uh, we have an explicit political orientation for business reasons, you know, we sell to political campaigns and you have to ID in one party or the other. Uh, and I also just realized that we might be perfectly antagonistic to Focusmate because we operate in the realm of social media and we want you to consume more of it. But I say that as somebody who would be an active consumer of Focusmate, so there's some irony there. Um, so the product that we're raising money for is called Pathia, and it's a software product that allows you to do all of these things in one process. We've learned the hard way how to do it uh, manually and on different platforms. So uh, my team is Michael, and we have a colleague who's not here right now. Uh, I'm a digital media veteran. Uh, what will be on my tombstone is that I was the founding editor of Gawker. But I also started a company called Breaking Media that has other niche properties, and I've run a very traditional newspaper called The New York Observer that's owned by Donald Trump's son-in-law slash senior advisor for everything. And my director of research is a former Democratic political pollster. So between the three of us, we have a combined 50 plus years of experience in digital and politics, and sometimes it feels like a million. Uh, so how do we do this now? You know, the, the way that we've done this 
as people who, who serve as political campaigns, but not just political campaigns, brands, media companies, we create content in one system, we test it in another, and we deploy it in another. And it's tedious and complicated and unwieldy. And we know this because we do this ourselves the hard way all the time. And right now, because we're doing a lot of political stuff, we're in between two campaigns right now. We just did work in the Virginia gubernatorial and House of Delegates elections, and we're just starting on messaging for the Alabama elections, which I'm sure even if you have no interest in politics, you've, you've probably heard a lot about. So I'm just going to talk about what happened in Virginia. We worked in the Virginia elections, and we did uh, two things where we did two campaigns in particular on Facebook that targeted specific types of voters with discrete messages designed to mobilize them to show up to the polls or not. And it wasn't even a fairly complex campaign, you know, where you're taking voter files and matching them against Facebook audiences and using relatively uncomplicated, uh, you know, content assets. And so this should have been simple. And here's where you hear the Ron Howard voiceover that just goes, it wasn't. Um, Michael was in charge of doing a lot of it. And just to deploy one ad to Facebook, we went through 58 discrete steps just dealing with the targeting piece of it. So I'll let Michael talk for a second about. So again, that's 58 steps, and that's not including generating and editing the content. And uh, we ran multiple campaigns. And if you want to compare them to optimize, you had to click through multiple screens and examine each campaign individually. Also, uh, while you're able to split test against different audiences, we weren't able to split test creative to see which worked, which was performing better. Um, and then there were some things that were very specific to political advertising, which added to the process. For example, Facebook uses an auction process, and, but it doesn't allow you to bid against yourself. So if you're running two campaigns, Facebook will privilege the one that's performing well, which is both a good and a bad thing. Because um, you ultimately you don't know if you're bidding against other similar organizations trying to do the same thing, and you're unable to digitally coordinate with organizations and the candidates that you're ultimately going to be working for. Yeah, so I wanted Michael to articulate that personally so that you could see the pain on his face while he was talking about it. Uh, so let's talk about why this is so complicated. And imagine not just deploying to Facebook, imagine having to deploy this campaign to Google and Twitter and every other social platform that's crucial right now. You know, one thing is that we have clunky campaign management systems on uh, platforms that don't really allow for easy scaling, and they're intentionally designed that way because larger social platforms don't really have an incentive to allow you to cross post to other platforms that are competitive. The other thing is just that the process is inherently siloed. We want to build something where it's, it's seamless. And then lastly, you know, the, the platforms are not really designed to make your message as effective as it, as it possibly can be. They're designed to have you keep using the platform, which is understandable. Uh, but we want to build a solution that works for companies that need to do this, and they need it to be effective. And so the solution is a product that offers simplified targeting, predefined optimization so that you're not repeating yourself every time you find something that works, uh, optimization for the enterprise user rather than the social platform's ad sales team, which is how the systems kind of work now, and then into in integration of creation, testing, and targeting. Just being able to do all of these things in a handful of screens is, is, is a big improvement on the 58 screens that Michael had to go through just to get one ad up that was optimally targeted. So what we're building, and, and we're in a time crunch, uh, we normally wouldn't be pitching at this stage because we don't have a product, but we, we sort of realized the hard way we need to build this, and we've talked to other organizations working on, particularly the 2018 midterms, we want something like this. Um, what can we build at minimum that's going to make this easier for everybody? But when you talk about the market for the MVP, we're not just talking about the political use case. We're talking about a use case for media companies and for large brands. So what's the market for that? Well, we think it's $1.6 billion because any brand could use this technology. You know, we're, we're dealing with the political use case, which is very specific, but there's no reason why making targeting easier for everybody isn't a good proposition. So here's the product set that we would have in the minimum viable product, which we think we could build in six months. Uh, single screen audience, target audience selection, not 20 click-throughs, one screen, especially if your targeting isn't that complicated. You're not trying to drill down into complicated psychographic profiles. 
A-B testing for creative, which you can't do in at least Facebook right now. You can A-B test against an audience, but you can't change one variable in your creative and figure out how it performs. Automated template campaign creation, an at-a-glance at a asset library, which if you've ever dealt with Facebook and you can't look at all of your assets at once at a glance, this is, uh, reduces a pain point for you. Streamline reporting, and then there are two things that are very specific to politics. Auction coordination, if you're trying to coordinate with other organizations, you're gonna end up bidding against each other. But if you have a read-only function where you can see what everybody else is doing, that's meaningful. And then the last thing is, if you're working on anything political, you're subject to, especially in an election, campaign finance regulations, just having a notification that if you hit a certain spend threshold, you should file. That's a very simple thing to do technically. There's, there's nothing that does that, that's built into a social system right now. And we have all sorts of hopes and dreams about what we would build in the Lamborghini version of this, which is the extended feature slide, but I, I wanna keep it to five minute presentation, so I'm just gonna gloss over that. Uh, our business model is freemium SaaS, and then we take a percentage of ad spend. The basic version offers A-B testing, targeting, and deployment on Facebook, that's it. Uh, ultimately, we, we'd add several other platforms, Google, Twitter, Snapchat, in that order. And then the pro version offers all the above, plus the things that you would need if you were running a professionalized campaign or a political organization. So that's us, thank you for your time. Um, thanks, guys. Um, so, obviously, a lot of the platform is rooted in data that's coming out of your advertising campaigns. Um, are there any blockages that you guys foresee in being able to uh, collect all that data um, out of a closed, closed system like Facebook and you know, be able to continually pull and call that data enough so that you can, you know, drive some automation and real intelligence in the platform. Yeah, that, that's a piece of it. Uh, the longer, when you talk about what we want to do longer term, we, we use Cambridge Analytica as an analog, or we say Cambridge Analytica, but not evil. Uh, we were using voter fi enhanced voter files in Virginia that you can buy from uh, data vendors who are either on the Republican side or the Democratic side, and they offer a lot of data variables that even Facebook uses. You know, people don't really understand the extent to which Facebook uses third-party data. Um, we do, so we don't need to necessarily, we're not as dependent on Facebook for the, the data about user behavior and interests as people think, because you can always load a third-party data set into custom audiences on Facebook and get the same results. So, uh, like any company, if we're building an MVP that's dependent on the Facebook API, we, we think of, Facebook is an inherent risk factor, and they're gonna change the algorithm all the time on a ro rolling basis, but they're not our only data source, so. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. All right, next up is Vamoose. Oh. Hi. So first off, if you look in your pamphlet there, it's gonna say what you may read to be Sefi Menda, that's actually Jeffy Menda. We did a little bit of a curveball. Uh, my name's Adam Christopher Troder. I'm the co-founder of Vamoose Payment Solutions, and uh, we're a really cool company. You guys got to get to know. Uh, basically, we started working on this pretty hard about a year ago. Jeffy and I were tirelessly trying to build a team and a product that we think can really fundamentally change the in-store experience for companies all over the world. Uh, Basically, we're here today to get some funding. We need to do some more rapid acquisition of users, and we think you guys can totally help out. Uh, so what I'd love to do is tell you a little bit about us. So to begin, there's really three key insights that we kind of took into consideration to create this company that we're looking at building, and we have began already getting live with a lot of our customers in New York City specifically. So the first thing is, if we look at companies like Seamless and Amazon, they really revolutionized or really helped expand the delivery sector while at the same time, the in-store kind of experience that we have as users going into any type of a company, it's remained exactly the same. It's really odd, right? I, I want something a little bit more exciting. Um, but the other thing is when we think about going into these types of locations, it's all about a fixed payment location, right? You have to get in line, you have to stay in that line until it's your turn to tell somebody what your order is and make your payment. I think it's a little ridiculous because it's focused around a cashier 
right? And at the end of the day, cashier is pretty unnecessary role. <laughs> it's basic data entry, it's not rocket science, it's pretty simple, and at the end of the day, a lot of companies have identified that this is a problem, and they tried to create solutions like kiosks, uh, but it's still creating the same problem. There's a line now in front of a kiosk, so it doesn't really make sense either, right? So we started thinking, we were like, okay, what if there was what we are now coining, uh, an omnipoint sales system. And essentially, it, what it could do is make this in-store shopping experience far more attractive than ever before. So this is kind of the question that we had in mind that led to our vision for Vamoose. And basically, it's kind of, you know, what about you know, making payments from anywhere for anything at any time, right? It's kind of like an Amazon Go for all. And the ability to really just not need to wait for anything anymore, you just instant gratification, kind of like the demographic that I'm in. Uh, the other thing that we saw is, okay, how are we going to get into this market? Because we do want to work with just about every type of company out there, but that's not really possible, right? So what we wanted to do is start off in the quick service and fast casual restaurant space, and there's a couple reasons why we did this. Uh, number one, it's operationally feasible, eliminating some of the risks that could be associated with this. But then number two, it's a rapidly advancing and a constantly expanding huge industry. Uh, you know, people are creating more and more franchise opportunities and companies are creating this even when they start off as a small mom and pop shop, kind of like one of our clients, Drunken Dumplings over on First Avenue. So basically, how are we going to do this, right? So it's through some key partnerships. Number one, we have an awesome tech team, seven guys that are super advanced that have been building kind of pickup applications and POS systems for the past 10 years. And what we've done is really the culmination of all their experience, all the problems that they've solved, that's what Vamoose is today. Uh, something else that we really believe is kind of going to make us attractive or kind of another aspect that's really going to make our kind of future goal possible is our business model, which is very unique, differentiates from anybody else that's going over the fast casual and quick service restaurant space. So we have two lines of revenue. Uh, the first would be from our client side, which is any restaurant. And basically, it's a really easy to acquire these clients. It's super predictable now. We've created an awesome kind of go-to-market strategy as, as long, or along with a, uh, a really smart cold call pitch to get in front of individuals. But less than 10 transactions a day, they never pay us. 10 to 100, it's a flat rate of $9 a day. And this is very different than anybody else that's kind of taking a commission uh, on every transaction. Then we also make a 7% on every transaction that a user makes. This is kind of like a little hidden fee that they sign off on under the T's and C's when they download the app. So, you know, if it's a $20 average order, we're making about a buck 40 per. Uh, so our business model is unique, and also we think that the relationships we're building with these customers is really superior to any other ones. We have such great relationships that we get horror stories from these individuals telling us about how much they hate Seamless and some of these other companies, uh, but also they hate their POS systems. Uh, so that's kind of where we come in and that's the future goal there. So this is kind of cool. This actually just happened this week and it kind of speaks to uh, our client acquisition side. Uh, literally, we got kids in college that are walking around introducing us to owners, right? And one of our guys got in touch with this owner of this bar, it's called the 20 Bar in Williamsburg, on Monday of this week. Tuesday, I went in there on the meeting and I closed the deal. I got him to give me all of his personal information, social security, bank account, et cetera. Last night, we implemented and we went live in there and in three hours, we collected $578, 45 transactions, 17 users. So we killed it. Uh, at the end of the day though, the merchant fit is absolutely there. We have 78 locations signed up at this point in time, but we've only implemented 36 of them. So I have a ridiculous next three weeks where I'll be in the other 42 locations doing implementations. Uh, and the other aspect that I think is really important here is that these guys love us. They super trust us. Uh, they'll let us actually go into their location go up to people that are waiting in line to put in an order and get those people to download the app. So that's our user acquisition strategy right now. Our chicken and egg are actually in the same basket. It's very advanced, it's working great. And the other thing that we're seeing is if we're able to get, what is it, like 10 downloads in an hour, that brings our actual user transaction acquisition cost down to $1. This is insane, right? So, I mean, as you guys may know, it's a lot higher, and some of these other companies give out $50 even just to get a user. We don't need to do that at all. So, the other thing that we're talking about is the ability for us to continually grow, right? We gotta get more and more locations, but it's really about the users at this point in time. So, we're looking for about 1.4 million. Anybody that has it, you can give me a call. We can start working together. 
And what we're going to do with that money over the next year is become extremely stable, obviously. We're already really good at this point in time. But what we want to do is invest in three main things. So the first thing is we want to improve our kind of user experience and interface on the front end to all of our customer side, like the client. Uh, and then on the back end, we have the most advanced technology where it's like a customer engagement and customer relations manager. So this is something that these restaurants do not utilize today. They really like it. And then the other aspect that we want to kind of build upon is our operational strength so that we can give higher quality customer service, not only to the users, but also to our clients. Uh, so to wrap it up, because I guess that's what's happening. Uh, listen, w Jeffy was here a year ago, right? A year ago, he was talking about this. There was no money. There was no product. There was no clients. There was no customers. There was nothing. There was just an idea, right? It's been a year. And we've had massive growth. We have an awesome product, super advanced back end. We got a bunch of customers, a lot of users. And more importantly, we're not going anywhere. So you should get involved right now. And I want to thank you all very much for your time. And uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Um, just a follow-up question on the, the scalability, because there have been so many point-of-sale solutions and so many QSR solutions that have either been deployed and failed, and merchants are just tired. So I'm just curious, how are you overcoming the objections, and how are you really going to scale like on a national basis, essentially? Yeah, that's great. Uh, so I actually didn't get a really awesome, I, I didn't get too much time, so I was trying to screw through. But basically, we also have a backed by a huge company. They're a $7 billion food company. They provide all the whole food products to the McDonald's, the Wendy's, the Chipotle's, the KFC's, everybody. Uh, so they're going to help us get into the large corporate locations. Um, but the other aspect is really just creating awesome relationships with them, right? We're not trying to take advantage of them. That's why our pricing model is as such, where it, we're incentivizing them to tell their customers to download this app and use it. So if you think about the $9 flat rate, if it's an average $20 order, 20 times 10 is 200, we're looking for $9, we're less than 5%. So if you juxtapose that to like a seamless 15 to 40% at time I've heard, which is ridiculous. So then we say, okay, if you're only at $10 or 10 transactions, you give us nine. But if you do incentivize your customers to actually use this and you get up to 100, 100 times 20 is 2,000, now I'm at less than 1%. So they really like us, and they hate their POS companies. So they actually are really supporting the idea that we turn into this full-service POS. And it's kind of a spin sale just to get in with them, that it's looking like a food pickup type application. But we're going to be a POS system that's going to hit every industry. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much. Um, Show of hands, any sports fans? Not working. Click is not working. Okay. Duke basketball, probably, yeah. Um, any fantasy sports users? Good. I'm glad there's not very many, because I probably know why everybody else does not play. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about win-win. Um, and kind of the, pro the way win-win came about was based off of fantasy sports and the fact that uh, these companies, you're probably familiar with FanDuel, DraftKings, they make billions of dollars. Um, and the athletes who are plastered across those platforms don't get any of that. Um, and that's not really cool. So I said, let's build something that is much more valuable to the athletes, right? Because they're people too. Um, so we created a marketplace that leverages gamification to connect fans with their favorite athletes and influencers while raising money for charitable causes. Um, hence the name Win-Win. And so the way it works is we, as a company, work directly with professional athletes, influencers, um, and they're, they're able to host a tournament on our platform. It's not fantasy, but it's similar in the sense that you're, you're making picks and predictions about games. So let's say Steph Curry's hosting that tournament. You're actually able to go into his tournament. You contribute to a charitable cause that he cares about, usually the player's foundation or some organization that they partner with. And now you're earning points in the actual tournament, right? You've made picks and predictions about who's going to win, Cavs versus Knicks, things like that. Um, and based on your accuracy, you earn points. Um, and instead of competing for you know, money like these other platforms, you're competing for experiences money can't buy, like Steph Curry calling you on FaceTime, right? Guarantee you, you won't find this on Amazon or you know, any other site, uh, but win-win. 
In fact, uh, you may be even ride on a private jet with Patrick Peterson from the Cardinals, which is something we did last year. Uh, three winners flew with him to the LSU versus Alabama game, sideline passes, the whole nine. Um, and so, you know, we, we pride ourselves first in making sure everybody wins, right? So the prizes, the way it's set up is everybody from first place to last place wins, guaranteed, no matter how many people are in the tournament. Um, so you can think of us almost as like a better alternative to a charity raffle or some auction, right? And so the way we accomplish this, and we don't pay for any of it, by the way, um, tier one is something that involves the influence in real time, right? So that's obviously being there on the jet with the fan, meeting them, you know, after a game for for a few minutes. Uh, tier two is something that the prize is related to the athlete, um, but not necessarily handled in real time. So this is autographed apparel, social media shout out. They usually have things like this already prepared and their, and their managers and folks like that handle it. Now, my, one of my favorite parts um, is tier three and it's from brands, right? So you can literally get last place in a tournament and walk away with $25 in free lift credits. Right? And so we work with brands and they provide the rest of the prizes. And really, when you think about it from a business perspective, uh, it's advertising disguised as a prize, right? Because now you've, met, you've, you've uh, psychologically earned that actual prize, so you're more inclined to use that credit, and brands love that, and they pay us for it. Um, so <laughs> we, we make sure that everybody wins, right? So as a fan, you're able to get this experience and access you normally wouldn't get, and the key is that you're competing for it as opposed to a low probability raffle or some uh, limited access auction. So you're competing while contributing and getting the warm fuzzies is, is always good. Um, as an influence, so you're raising awareness and funding for things you really care about, uh, natural boost in your marketability, positivity around your image, uh, connectivity to the fans. And I think the charities get a big win because they get this uh, sustainable tool we call gamified giving. Um, and it allows them to reach really effectively uh, millennials and other non-traditional donors. Um, and we take a cut of the action, and so I feel like we're winners as well. Um, and, you know, the, the big question that comes up, you know, from a lot of our investors and folks like that is, well, how do you get these athletes, right? These guys are really hard to get, get to, you know, get them involved in anything. It costs a lot of money to, to post and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so I actually was one of those guys. Um, so went from Duke University to Tom All-American um, and, and had an opportunity to go tackle some more people uh, after doing it, you know, for, for the team. And so after a few years, um, you know, kind of took that experience and everything else and, and you know, became a self-taught coder, designer, uh, went through Draper University, finished number one there in Silicon Valley, so now I'm in the Bay. Um, went through 500 startups this year, worked at a startup, and uh, now running my own. So when you think about somebody being kind of at the intersection that, that you need to execute on this, um, from acquiring not only the athletes, but also the technical chops to actually build it and run it, um, it's a win-win right here sitting in front of you. So <laughs> leverage, leveraging, that, leveraging that network has obviously allowed me to bring on a bunch of my friends, and grow that network of athletes, um, and they love what we're doing. And like I said, we don't pay them at all. Um, we found a unique way to incentivize them uh, to post on their own social media pages. So when you're talking, you know, cost of customer acquisition, it's really, really interesting there. Um, and then it gets really, really interesting as we scale vertically, right? So now you can think about retired players, entertainers, teams, uh, influencers, and even brands running these tournaments, raising money for things they care about. Um, I'll kind of fly through these. Basically, we're better than other platforms, right? Like auctions and, and uh, things like that. It's, you know, people want to play this. Um, there's a variety, right? So then as we go into entertainment games, right? Now you're picking who's going to win, you know, best male actor in the Oscars, something like that. Um, and it's tax deductible. So we actually, the way our model's set up, you're donating directly to the Win Win Foundation, our separate 501c3, gets you the tax percentage or the tax deduction, and then we forward the money on to Win Win Corporate as well as uh, our partners. We make money, um, again, we take a slice of the action and then we charge brands to be intertwined into these tournaments. Um, this was just a cheesy metaphor I had. We're basically, you know, the hook, um, attracting the fish, and uh, the brands want this fish, so we said, pitch your line to, to our hook, and now you can enter, it seamlessly interact with, with, these, uh, with these fans, right? So now it's the Steph Curry win-win tournament powered by Pepsi. Um, and they're winning because they get meaningful engagement, athlete uh, alignment without having to strike the deal directly, uh, the video content, all of that good stuff. So in closing, we got a bunch of, bunch of brands, a bunch of uh, influencers, 
This thing is charitable, uh, highly, highly shareable, and these, can and these tournaments last about a week, um, and so we're rolling them out. You can go to trywinwin.com. Um, it's a web app. We didn't want you to click from Steph Curry's uh, tournament or his, his actual post and land on an app store page you never heard of. We want to take you right into the experience um, so we don't, we don't have any breakage in that funnel. So that's it for me. Thank you. So totally get the idea, really like it. And I see how you can scale across all the different areas that you mentioned, but one thing that came to mind was both influencers and brands really are brands in themselves, and they care about who they're associated with. So what's the plan to be able to do that matching whenever you are in all of these different verticals? Yeah, no, great question. So um, the way we, I mean, it's a pretty manual process where we, you know, we talk with the players, right, as well as the brands, and we match them based on several different things. Um, and obviously the main one, there can't be any brand conflict, right? So if, uh, you know, you're sponsored by Bose, we can't, we're not gonna have Beats by Dre as, as you know, powering your tournament. Um, but really it's, it's kind of a collaborative effort. Um, even when we talk with our influencers, we actually start that conversation off with who are your current endorsement deals with, who, who is seeding products to you, who's friendly with you, and we'll start there because they're, they're, they're gonna be more likely to you know, power your, your tournament. Because what that means for the, for the influencers is that the brand is paying us that integration because it's really advertising and marketing on their end. Um, you know, influencer marketing, cause marketing without having to go do it themselves. Um, and to make it make sense for the influencer, the brand makes a donation to the cause that they're actually raising money for. Um, and so it's a really like feel good you know, opportunity on both ends. Um, but we're very cognizant of, of that, like, you know, that matching, if you will. Hope that answers the question. And I'm around to, to chat also. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so here's what's gonna happen is you three are gonna go with Bill and Ryan. Do you mind joining in with them as well? Is that cool? And uh, Ray, Frank, Suhani, Uzo, uh, uh, Monica, Eliza, go ahead and join them too as observers, please, if you don't mind. Uh, go ahead and follow Bill this way. And they're gonna have about 10 or so minutes to select their winner. And while they're doing that, you, the audience, um, we're going to do three things. One is that you, the audience, you're going to vote for your favorites right now. Uh, that's one. Two is that we're going to do a group Q&A with all the teams um, up here on stage. And three is we're going to uh, do an open mic if we have more time while we're waiting for them. Let any of you come up to introduce yourself, whether you're uh, a startup, whether you're looking for a job, whether you're new to New York, whether you've moved back to New York, whatever you want to say. Monica, yes. <laughs> Okay, so uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to bring up all the teams on stage. So um, Jake and everybody, come on up here. Okay, who's got a question for the teams right here in the front? Jake, do you have applications beyond attention like for anxiety? Um, for example, my father has Parkinson's and um, anxiety is a really big problem for him. And I wonder if this, the application would help someone with other diseases like that. Absolutely. So that's a great question. So we're starting with attention, but anxiety is the very next thing we want to do. And there are signatures in the EEG patterns of people with anxiety that we can try to train with, uh, with a training experience um, where we get feedback on that. So anxiety definitely is the next thing we're doing. And do you the visuals that they the visuals that they have to do to train being different because just the sampling you sent the first thing I thought of is okay my dad would have a lot of anxiety just from trying of course to do that so yeah the idea is that you'd build a visual training experience that's customized to that kind of situation so anxiety would be maybe a relaxing beach scene that you know calming waves or other things that would that would help amplify the effect of the training um, so we have, we have games that require you to focus that kind of mirror that focus effect. But if it was anxiety, then it would be something different. Yep. Thank you. Next yep. question over there, Willa. Hi, I have a question for Scramblers. So I work for a high protein startup called Bonza. High protein is very popular in the food space right now. Do you have a working prototype or any sort of concept right now that, that is triable or tasteable? Because that's a big benchmark to meet. 
Yeah, uh, I left some with the judges. I unfortunately don't have enough for everyone. <laughs> Great, that's an important thing. Yep. Cool, thank we, you, we, Willa. We are looking for a retort co-packer, though, if you know of anyone. You two should connect. All right, next question. I think I saw a hand somewhere here. Don't be shy. Who's got the next question here? Right. Over here, all right. A question for win-win. Does your business model make sense if you don't take a cut from the charities? I can see that being a, a barrier to giving X number of dollars to a charity and not having it all go there. Does the branding provide enough revenue that makes the business really work for you? Yeah, it definitely does. Um, you know, and early on, I think the the brand revenue, uh, it, I think the brand revenue will ultimately potentially surpass, um, you know, our, our user revenue, if you will, from the from the charities. Um, but to your point about, I don't know if you mean like a barrier to entry for the charities to come on board with the athlete or the user that's making the donation, but we haven't um, we haven't run into any of that uh, as of now, um, just in the sense of um, you know people making making the donation or the charities coming on board. And really, what we're selling to the charities from that angle is that um, this platform is is very very hands off uh, for them. So it allows them to acquire like new donors, uh, raise a lot of money. Um, it's almost like a SaaS product in a sense um, where they're able to leverage the platform to raise money. And we're not really looking to replace, you know, their annual 5K or, or these big offline events, which take a lot of time and money. Uh, by leveraging gamification and the technology, uh, we're able to do it very quickly. Um, and, and then the experience for the fans, obviously, um, to, be, to be quite frank, the, ma the majority of our users are coming for the jet ride. Um, but the fact that they can also support the charity um, is, is kind of like the cherry on top. Very good. Next question. Yes, up front here. Monica, we'll get you a mic. How are you? So I have a question for Focusmate. Um, so uh, it looks like your product is relatively uh, straightforward right now. How do you evolve? Uh, how do you envision it evolve in the next few years? What would it look like five years from now, or two years? <laughs> Great question. Um, so, uh, sort of long-term vision way to think of it. You can even integrate concepts of VR and AR, where this is this is a virtual workspace, a place where you go hang out. So, you might do a fifty-minute working session, and then during your ten-minute break, you go to uh, the water cooler and you. You take a break and you chat with other people, or you go to the the active break room and you do some air squats with people that are that want to actually like move their bodies a little bit in between sessions. So um, that's an aspect of it is that there's more to engage you. It's more personalized, um, and then and then the tribe that you cultivate in your focus mate experience is also deeply personalized. So like I mentioned, um, you might be you might join the Duke uh, affiliate. Group, um, you might be say you're a writer. You want to join a, a group for romance novel writers. Um, so you, you start to develop a personalized tribe um, and, and relationships with those people. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and then we're going to switch over to open mic, where anybody can come on stage, stage and say hello. One more question, anybody? Anybody? Okay, let's give everyone a round of applause here. And if um, one one last thing, if anybody wants to um, go to the Oakland Raiders versus Cowboys game for free, you can go to trywinwin.com and enter the tournament right now. I like it, that's good, very good. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so um, the uh, last thing we're gonna do uh, while we are waiting for the judges is it's open mic time. So anybody in the audience can introduce themselves. You know, I'm a new alum, and I just moved to the city. I have a startup. I'm looking for a job. I'm looking to hire somebody. If anybody wants to come up and say hello, um, please do so. And here we have our first customer, Dan. Yeah. Hi, uh, um, I'm Dan Agarwal. I'm in a very early, early stage startup called findtaxpro.com. The website is live. The, the basic idea is it's a lead generation for tax professionals 
who are work who are CPAs who are working in industry, but during the tax season have excess capacity to do tax preparation for individuals or for businesses. So they don't they cannot market themselves or you know they don't want to do all the administrative work. FindTaxPro.com solves that problem. I'm looking for if someone wants to, if someone is good in UI UX, I'd love to chat with you because my product is missing that piece. So uh, if you want to chat, thanks. Next up, and then we're just going to go to general networking. Hey, everyone. My name is Nassar Gamim. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm a Fuqua 14 from the Cross Continent Program. I'm a health tech entrepreneur. I just recently started a company called Overtone Health. And uh, we're basically building a chronic patient monitoring solution that's completely automated. It tracks you know, the patients. Not only it integrates with all your trackers, et cetera, but it actually tracks your, you know, your lungs, your heart. The actually, there's a wearable device that you wear around your neck, and you can actually really get, capture the, the true you know, the symptoms that are really occurring with uh, heart failure patients and COPD patients. So we are very early stage. I've kind of built a prototype, and uh, I have a team of two to three people, you know, two and a half actually, uh, looking for early stage kind of just uh, you know some boost with a little bit of uh, seed funding, and also anyone who's, who's interested in joining and you know curious, please stop by, say hello. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's one, just one, just one. Yeah. Okay. I know we're identical twins, but I'm the talker, so he's just here up here to look pretty. Uh, my name is Colin Jones. This is Cameron Jones. We're Duke 2011. We're actually uh, teammates of Mike. Uh, he's a laugh riot. His locker's right next to ours. So everybody is in the tech space or something similar, um, but the two of us actually do entertainment. So um, we're actually working on funding a movie uh, called Rise to Freedom. It's about 14 African-American soldiers who won the Congressional Medal of Honor during the Civil War. And given you know, the landscape that we are in right now, we feel like it's a story worth being told. So we, I've been out to LA a couple times. Uh, director, producer, script is locked. Um, so we'd love to just talk to anybody who kind of wants to shift gears a little bit out of the tech space um, or the medical space or the business space and kind of move more towards entertainment because we think there's a, a capacity to do some incredible things there as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Chang Zhang. I'm uh, Trinity class of 2007. Uh, I joined a uh, startup recently. Uh, it's called Clover Health. So Clover Health is a Medicare uh, Advantage payer. So we're actually an insurance company in the Medicare space. Um, and my role there is actually to form strategic partnerships with life science companies. Um, so that includes uh, pharma, biotech, but also includes uh, device companies. Um, so if you have a product, uh, whether it's therapeutic or a particular uh, device, and you wanted to use it to, to test and engage with uh, a certain population, uh, especially with the elderly population, I uh, would definitely look forward to have a chance to connect with you and see if we can do something very interesting together. Thank you. Hi, uh, so my name is Ege. Uh, we recently started a company called Sapo Shop. Uh, you know, it's a hassle to move out in this country. People are trying to get rid of their furniture when they're moving out in order to like, keep their security deposits when they're on the lease. So what we do is we basically buy their furniture at low cost when they're like, I'm sorry to say this, when they get desperate because they're trying to get rid of them. So we buy their furniture and we resell them. Um, we're a new company, so if you or your friends are planning to move out, we are the right choice. <laughs> Very good. I like it. OK, with that, uh, we're just going to let you all network with one another while we wait. I hope that you will take a chance and meet somebody new. Uh, maybe just turn around and say hi to your neighbor. Thank you. Teams, come on up here. We're going to have the judges give feedback. The Mitchell, if you don't mind coming over here, the first team to receive feedback is going to be Casper, probably. Carpe? Is that true? OK. Casper, come on up here and receive your feedback. OK. Are we on? OK. Awesome. Um, go ahead and go. You can just yeah. chat with him. Yep. Well, I, I just wanted to say, first off, uh, awesome job to all the teams. Um, 
you know, we, we went back and we were talking about all the different products and all the different teams and, and presentations. And um, we just had to say that, you know, every single one of them had, you know, a lot of great points and a lot of excitement around it and a lot of, you know, really well thought out um, business model and opportunities. So good work, everyone. Um, it seems like everyone's headed, you know, in the right direction here. Uh, so um, we really thought your product was really super interesting. Uh, congrats to you guys for getting that off the ground while in school uh, and already to a million dollars of revenue. That's awesome. Um, seems like you've, you've hit on something that, you know, is a real market need, uh, something that there's a hole in the market for. Um, and, um, you know, we, we had a couple suggestions. The first was, you know, you, you may want to try a, a little bit more in the digital channel, you know, buying, even if you're just, you know, targeting teenagers, which you said have the problem, you know, twice as much as adults um, in, you know, maybe particular areas, maybe more affluent areas, I don't know. But, you know, try to target them a little bit more because that is definitely going to be cheaper and more efficient than TV. Ultimately, TV is easier, but once you're at, like, much bigger scale. Um, and then the other thing to think about is trying to drive some sort of subscription. I mean, this seems like the perfect sort of thing for you know a, a monthly subscription, and you can have this as an ongoing annuity and revenue stream. So we actually launched that a month ago. You can have Look at that! <laughs> All right, good work. All right, thank you. Yes. Okay, Taylor with Focusmates. Focusmate. Come on up. Okay. Um, great job. Again, from my perspective, everyone in the presentations was excellent, really solving interesting problems and um, phenomenal teams, advisory board, just very, very strong across the board. Um, so focus mate, I think um, you're addressing a very interesting issue and um, choosing to use technology to do that is interesting. I, I think um, a couple of sort of questions and, and things to think about would be, um, do you tap into, from a distribution and kind of partnership model, do you think about partnering with executive coaching firms or specific communities or even um, a lot of remote workers or independent contractors, those that might need that extra support? And so how do you build the right strategy and partnerships to scale? Because there might be a reluctance to interact with a stranger unless it's kind of sanctioned by an alumni group, an executive coaching kind of get that stamp of approval in some way to kind of validate the model um, or, or the value. And then I guess on the business model side, I think it seems like it needs a little bit of refinement in terms of what's free, what do you charge for, and maybe that's going to come with due course. I know it's a little bit early, um, but I think it comes at a moment where we have the technology infrastructure, a lot of independent, lonely workers are in this country. And so I think it's, it's the right time for the business that you're setting up. So I think you're on the right path. Great. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Mitchell. Oh, I'm keep going. All right. Living Lab. Oh, OK, right. So. Awesome uh, idea. Um, the group we talked about, um, is it possible to think about refining and simplifying one problem at a time and making it more, I guess, tangible from a cost and participation standpoint? So could you think about tiering the product so that the entry fee is a little bit lower from a subscription model perspective and not take on all of the capex and the furnishings and all the comp complexity and risk that comes along with it? Because even if you just nailed kind of, I hate to use this, but the Tinder for roommates backed by very qualified information around each of the potential roommates. I think that's of extreme value just in, in and of itself. And then maybe you can tier on those extra services um, because taking on the CapEx is maybe not something you want to do right out of the gate. Um, but I think it's a service that is clearly needed Certainly in the U.S., people move constantly, whether it's through universities and, and across the cities. So I, I think we all thought it was a great, great solution solving a good problem, but you just may want to simplify the, the model and the um, approach. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, next up is Jake. Hey, Jake. 
so thanks for showing us that. Uh, super cool science behind it. I mean, and very interesting uh, and great team behind it. I mean, amazing group of advisors and uh, uh, it seems like uh, just a lot of work went into that. It's very impressive. Um, so I, I think our biggest uh, comments were around, um, you know, the the lifetime value of a customer um, and the business model that you guys are going after. Um, you know, it certainly makes sense to sell the device. Uh, and then the subscription fee um, seemed like something that could be uh, kind of like a gym membership, you know, where you get people who are excited about it and they want to use it at first. Um, but you know they may drop off, and um, and and you know gyms usually will lock you in for a long time. Um, so just thinking about different ways to lock the customer in. Maybe maybe you know that contract like long term contracts may not work here, but you know upfront payments could work. Um, you know keeping them continually engaged is going to be really important. You know building you know some sort of um, not marketing campaigns, but um, effort, engagement campaigns, yeah, to bring them back into the platform on a continual basis uh, before they get hit with the credit card fee for their second month, uh, I think will be important in just keeping that long-term customer. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Very good. Scramblers, Matt. Matt Tolnick. All right. All right, this is for Scramblers. So thanks for the sample. We all tried it, and it's, it's really good. It was definitely a surprise. Um, so I kind of to try. <laughs> no, I was excited. So I think we all identified with the problem that you mentioned around the current breakfast options being full of sugar and carbs and things like that. Um, we we're really impressed that you are have done this before. Um, definitely the relationships with the uh, different places where you would sell is huge. Um, I think that one thing that we had on our minds was who is your target customer and how do you roll that out? So you mentioned sort of that ick factor. I think if people try it, they'll like it, but just learning a little bit more about what that plan would look like. Thanks. All right, thank you. Stella Life, Sid. Hey, Sid. Um, so uh, first off, I think you know we can all identify with the challenges of setting new toys up in our house and you know obviously when it comes down to you know medical devices it's it's not just setting up you know that new cool light you know connected light bulb it's you know something that really matters to you right so um, it can it can add a lot more stress and and be something that can be you know uh, way more difficult than it needs to be so you're you're hitting on something that I think is really important um, you know I think the thing that you know we wanted you to think about was you know simplification of your uh, your go-to-market strategy, um, it seemed to be a bit of a boil of the ocean type strategy. Um, now maybe that was just because we heard it for five minutes, and you do have a very defined path that you want to go down. Um, but you know, I would think about working with maybe a very defined set of you know devices or with a particular supplier at first, and you know, making them have this seamless, magical kind of solution, and then tacking on additional partners as you go. Thank you. Next up is Elizabeth Spires. No relation to Brittany Spires. So I've used Business Manager before and totally get the problem that you're solving. I don't know if anyone else has, but they will immediately. Um, so definitely get what you guys are going toward and the A-B testing being something that a lot of people don't have the resources for. One thing that was a concern for us, especially when you're thinking about political campaigns, is the limited budget that they have and sometimes the amount of cost associated with running true A-B tests to figure out what's optimized. And then the other piece was the MVP had everything in it, which in one way is awesome, but it also seemed like there it could have it could be a little bit on the complex side. So thinking about if there's any way to simplify what you guys have on the roadmap there. Brands, but you're, you're totally right. That's a it's a narrow use case, and their spending is much lower. So we we we're we're hoping to build something that works for large brands too. So thank you. Thank you. Moose. Adam. 
So um, great product, very interesting problem that you're trying to solve. I think that it's a really hard problem that you're trying to solve and that you need both the merchants and the customers on board. It seems like you've got great relationships with the merchants and one of the backers that you mentioned will be a great way into that. So one thing that we were really focused on was around the customers. And you mentioned acquisition, but thinking about retention. So after you get somebody to download it, how do you make sure that they know and they remember that that restaurant or that um, quick service uh, restaurant has that your app whenever they come back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And last up, Mike. Okay. Win win. Um, well, First, I think we thought it was a very um, interesting combination of sort of a triple bottom line business, which is interesting, I think, to a lot of folks, having the charitable um, aspect, combining athletes and brands, and then the business model of really being able to scale by taking a transaction fee. Um, Obviously, relationships matter. Um, clearly, you, you've gone down the path of really trying to build out that you know 125 plus athlete network. I think there's tremendous opportunity with any individual, whether it's a, a performer, an artist, to really you, you can take this beyond obviously a, athletes, yeah. but more and more um, individuals are becoming individual brands, and so I th we, we think there's a lot of potential. I think right now it sounds like it's quite manual in terms of the brand matching with the charitable cause and the uh, athlete, but you could we could easily see being able to kind of over time build databases and write sort of, sort of um, matching algorithm so that you can scale that faster, even though those personal relationships will matter. But that's one thing to think about is how, to, how do you scale? You've got to have a database of like every athlete, who they're sponsored by, and all the associations. If not, It'll be too labor intensive, so I'm oh, sure you're sure. thinking about that. Um, so, but I think we all agree that it was um, a really interesting solution from a variety of perspectives. And the fact I notice you have someone on board from Keep, uh, yeah. known that company a long time, helped them yeah, get I'll investment. Led their, I'll led their Oh, did you? Okay. And so having that gamification yeah, experience that. is very important here too. Um, so. With all that said, um, the the team is happy to announce that Win Win is the winner. <laughs> so thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to bring all the panel or all the uh, all the uh, presenters on stage for a quick group photo. Uh, Monica, Ryan, Bill, if you don't mind joining us as well. Uh, but before we do the photo, I just want to announce the after party. Uh, if you want to join us, we're going to be at Hill Country Barbecue Market. I know it sounds crazy, but it's actually it's actually uh, a good spot. There's a lot of room up front. It's uh, on 26th Street between 6th and Broadway. So again, Hill Country Barbecue Market, uh, 26 between uh, Broadway and 6th. Let's give uh, one last round of applause to everybody here tonight that helped.